you write music yourself? I, I write very little original material. I don't, I haven't got this pang to go out and do original uh, material so much. Um, I do occasional stuff. Um, but my improvisation on every gig is original for me. So I, and there's some great, there's so, so many great songs out there uh, which are vehicles for my, for my uh, improvisation. That um, why? Should, yeah, I don't think I can sit down and improve on that but, um, to an extent. Although I do a lot of arranging, which again is a sort of a, a, an individual input. Um, so you can take a song and transform it into your own, mould it into your, your individual uh, uh, interpretation. Um, I think maybe maybe in years to come I might I might sit down and write write some more original material. But but I don't I don't feel that there's a necessity to to write original material for the sake of it. For I've got to be original. I don't feel that pressure. Whereas I think some musicians do. Yet I often pick up an album by some talented musicians of, of my generation and, and and younger, and there's all these original tunes on it, and maybe one or two um, traditional tunes. And um, it's very rarely do I find that there's a... It, it, it doesn't grab me. I think tunes... I mean, composition is a, a whole instrument in itself that you have to learn and develop and practice all your life. Um, it's not something you can just sit down and. I'm okay. You can have ideas and and, um, but but to write whole albums worth of original tunes, not many people can really pull that off to a to what I'd consider a um, a high standard. Do you listen to music to unwind or relax, or, or, or are you, do you never unwind and relax? <laughs> I do listen to music to unwind, yes. Yes, very much. Um, but some, there's sometimes when you just need silence, peace and quiet. But, um, <laughs> or sometimes I'll think, oh, I need to listen to so-and-so because I've got to do some concerts and that, or I've got to do some practice for a certain concert or develop in a certain area and then the tune will come on or an artist will come on and will absolutely knock me sideways and I'll start dancing around the room and and uh, shouting in joy and happiness <laughs> So who, who would you listen to typically if you wanted to unwind? Oh if that I couldn't I couldn't name... You haven't got a, a favourite CD or a record that you'd put on? Or? I've got many favourite CDs and records. Many. And it, it'd just be the, the the right one for the right mood and for the right time. I mean, it could be the classic um, a classic Miles Davis album, you know, Kind of Blue. It's always fantastic to come back to. Just just the atmosphere on that album is just so good. And it's such a high-selling album as well, yeah. Um, another... Favourite of mine would be Bunny Berrigan's interpretation of the Bix Beiderbeck tunes that Bix wrote for the piano, which was In a Mist, Candlelight, Walking the Dog in the Dark. Um, and he had a wonderful arranger. It was a big band arrangements in the 30s. And uh, his arrangement was, his arranger and piano player was Joe Lippmann, and he wrote these wonderful arrangements. That could be another little. Uh, album that will, that I'll look for and of course you always can always put Billy Holiday on and just sit back and Art Tatum again you know I got you know I can go on and on Billy Goodman um Clifford Brown's a huge fan of my, you know I, I'm a big fan of Clifford Brown I sit sit and listen to Clifford play um with a quartet all night you know. and Sonny Rollins as well you know uh, you know if if I sit here, I'll, I can be here for the next twenty minutes reeling off as they come to my mind. You know, you worked with the Pasadena Roof Orchestra, who Lucy's uh, a big fan of. 
Uh, what can you tell us about them? Well, Pasadena was my first um, professional gig. Uh, well, no, not my second second professional gig. Um, as I uh, came out of college and was finding my way, um, I firstly th- I did three years three years with Ken McIntosh, um, which was a great experience, fantastic um, learning learning curve. And then I got the gig with the Pasadena Roof Orchestra, which um, and we went off round Europe. This is my experience of Belgium, as I was saying earlier, and Germany and Holland, Switzerland, the local. Our local neighbours in Europe, Scandinavia. Um, I had, had a great experience travelling with them and uh, learnt all that, that 30s dance band era stuff. Because it, it was it's primarily a dance band, although when, we do, do, when you do a jazz club, you can pull a lot more jazz material out and, and everyone, everyone can open up a little bit more. But, but generally speaking, it's a dance band and... Uh, a very good dance band. I mean, if I was getting married and I could afford the Pasadena Road Focus, I'd be delighted, you know. Yeah. Yeah. The great 20s and 30s. The, the great dance music, 20s and 30s, really. Yeah. So you're here at the, the Jazz Festival in Fleetwood. You uh, you get to a lot of different jazz festivals uh, all over the place. What, what do you do in between times? Musically. Um, musically, I'll pick up gigs at local restaurants, clubs in London, and functions. You know, people phone you up to do all sorts of different do things. Do you have a, a regular band that you play with? Not really. The, my only regular is Acker Bilk. Um, I, I took the chair with Acker about seven years ago, and... Uh, which has been a, a sheer delight because Zach is such a lovely guy to work with. Um, he always he comes out. He only does about uh, you know four or five gigs a month. So when he comes out, he's he's ready to have a laugh and a and a drink and a and a good play, you know. So all the gigs are always good fun on stage. We always everyone enjoys it, and you're not playing every night, so it doesn't get stale and it doesn't doesn't get too uh, too much. Um, so that's my only uh, um, regular commitment. Um, I, I, I'll work quite a lot with uh, Keith Nichols over the year. Well, I say quite a lot. I mean, one, once once a month, I suppose it is. Um, with with his uh, he's got a um, a wonderful array of diff- different bands and 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 uh, collections. Uh, for uh, again, mostly it's the jazz festivals I work with Keith. You know, um, small jazz clubs around England. Yeah, quite different. And and I, my my um, my musical uh, styles actually are, are quite wide. My jazz styles cover right from early New Orleans and Louis Armstrong, Hot Five stuff, etc. All the way through the Dixieland, the uh, the swing era, and then into bebop, and then post bop and modern stuff. Basically, I I play most of the styles of jazz, and um, so to be able to play different styles every night, I find keeps me very fresh, stops me getting stale. Last night you picked a piece that we noticed was very very. Unusual. It was the um, Albert Camus one. What's it called? The infir- Saint Ger- James Infirmary Blues. You picked on picked on that one and played that last night. What what is it about that one you like? Well, you say it's unusual. It's actually a big big number in the, in the repertoire of the uh, New Orleans uh, bands. Um, I mean, there's a my I went to New Orleans with my father when I was a kid. And uh, my father rang up a trumpet player who, who he knew there. And um, this trumpet player, most of you out there and you here probably know him. And his name is Alvin Alcorn. Now, you won't know him by name, but uh, you'll know him by, um, 
by films because he was in the James Bond film Live and Let Die. They had a scene in New Orleans where there was a funeral march and as the funeral march was walking through the street, this guy comes up with a, with a black trilby hat and, uh, and the guy says, whose funeral is it? And they go, yours. And he stabs him. That is Alvin Elkhorn doing a, a walk on extra part. He was, he was leading the marching band. Now, uh, and Alvin, you know, works, works in New Orleans around all the jazz clubs. So my father says, Alvin, do you know any way we could come and play? We're, we're visiting the city that we could, my son and I, that we could come and sit in with the band. Alvin says, look, I haven't got anything regular for this week. He says, but I've got a funeral tomorrow. Come and, come and play in the funeral, funeral march. And my father says, well, that's a bit unusual, really. He says, and we're dressed in our, um, all, all our top tourist garb, uh, and you've got uniforms. Are you sure it'll be all right? And Alvin says, yeah, it's no problem, man, come along. So we actually played alongside this marching band, walked to the funeral and played just the closer walk with the, the funeral march. Doom. Slow march all the way there. So that's the, that's where St. James Infirmary comes from. Although I tend to do it as a, 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 a higher tempo, a faster tempo than the Jersey. But um, that's a tradition of this um, this this funeral thing, which. Even though it's a minor key, and I went to St. James Infirmary, and his wife's, his, his girl has died, and it's all sad. I mean, it's, the number goes down really well, and I love it. I love doing it, and the audience love it as well. So it's, it has the opposite effect that, that you'd think. It's, you know, it's well, not like playing the dirge, like you know. Said about the, whole, the whole point about having um, a jazz band at a funeral, I, I told my solicitor that's what I want. He says, what's one of those? But well, how long's a piece of string? What is one of those? Um, because you can't be miserable for long. No matter Hello. what the music is, it will lift your spirits. Sorry? That's exactly right. And uh, just to finish the, the original story of walking towards the funeral, you play the dirge, the, the slow march, and the band stays outside the cemetery gates. The body's interred, and when they come out, that's when you play something like the Saints. Dun, 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 dun. All the umbrellas come out, and everyone, everyone from the funeral party starts hooping and and yelling and screaming, yeah, in the air, celebrate. And that is the real, you know, you've you've grieved on the way to the funeral, and now it's like right now, come out and celebrate the life. And it really was a wonderful experience, that. Sound, sound really fantastic. Yeah, uh, and I was about, Brilliant. again, I was about eight or nine, and um, that memory stayed with me so strongly. Again, I'm the same as you. I'd, I'd like the same at <laughs> New Orleans' funeral. Yeah.